we are now. But the first question is, why eyeglasses? So who wears glasses? Yay, a whole room of glasses wear. So you're totally typical. Um, so 70% of people over the age of 40 need reading glasses. And then depending on what country you're in, between 10 and 50% of children uh, have myopia and need glasses. Um, and so why eyeglasses? Well, I think everybody knows, you know, take your glasses off and try to go through today's conference without them. Um, try to find a pathway out of poverty without seeing clearly, and it's kind of t tricky. So, so why eyeglasses? A couple of the numbers. Um, so uh, 700 million people in the world don't have the eyeglasses that they need to see clearly. There's nothing innovative about eyeglasses. Eyeglasses are 700 years old as a technology. Um, and so why don't people have them at the base of the pyramid when you can source them from China and land them in Rwanda for a dollar? Uh, and so we're looking at the question of demand and supply and what's fundamentally broken in the optical sector. Um, what's really great about 700 million people needing glasses is that actually the majority of them, 500 million people, just need reading glasses. And the thing about reading glasses is they're just magnifying glasses. And you don't need a doctor. And you don't need an optometrist. And so one of the biggest lockups in the optical sector has been the perception that glasses are a medical good that you have to consult a doctor to get them. And in the US, we see glasses readily available in bookstores or in pharmacies, and that's just not the case. Um, in Kenya, none of the pharmacies sell glasses. Uh, in Nigeria, you can get glasses in pharmacies, but they start at 18 and 20 bucks. And so one of the questions we have for ourselves is, how do we accelerate the inevitable? How do we, how do we get glasses to the base of the pyramid consumer? And why should we do that? Well, what we know is that glasses will increase productivity by 35%, and that will have a direct impact on individual household income of approximately 20%. So if you do the math in rural India, it turns out that a dollar 25 pair of glasses can give somebody $108 of incremental income in one year. And that's kind of a radical return on investment if you can convince the user that, in fact, uh, glasses would be of benefit to them. And so for us, uh, so far, Vision Spring has helped to generate $280 million in economic impact, which feels really good as a relatively small organization. Um, so our mission, uh, we're creating access to affordable eyewear everywhere. We have a goal to get to 10 million pairs uh, by the very symbolic <coughs> year 2020. Um, and we're really doing that so we can create $2.6 billion in earning potential and really importantly, enhance learning outcomes for students. Um, and so for us, our average customer earns less than $4 a day. Um, and we want at least half of our customers to be first time wearers. We want them to be getting glasses for the first time in their life. And so we want to play that market introduction, market seating role. Um, we want to reach people who have not previously been served by the optical market. And really, one of uh, our, our core value propositions to our investors is that we want to be the most efficient philanthropic investment per pair of glasses to the base of, of the pyramid consumer, and that we can provide a 26 fold return on that philanthropic dollar investment. OK, so what's our theory of change? Everyone's like, oh, no, not a theory of change. OK, it turns out theories of change, though, are really helpful for alignment. They're really helpful for team organizing. They're really helpful when you have to say no to opportunities, because there are so many opportunities. Um, and it's also really helpful for board and management alignment. So we went through a theory of change exercise, and we took our board. We all went through it together. So, Classic, right? At the top, we would be pretty naive to think that a pair of glasses can get somebody out of poverty. Like a heck of a lot of things have to go right for that to be true. There's all these external factors and context. But the reason why we're in business is because, you know, we want there to be a greater likelihood of having that pathway out of poverty. So we can control, though, the fact that glasses will create for low income people um, the improve, that they can improve and maintain their functioning. Uh, and their productivity and their earning potential. And we can measure that, right? OK, so underneath that, our direct outcomes are we want low-wage earners to gain years of enhanced productivity and enhanced um, earning. So the thing is, imagine you're an artisan. You depend on your work, you know, 12 to 24 inches from your face. And as you 
are peaking in the extraordinary skill that you have, your eyes are failing. You have presbyopia. Your lenses are just getting stiff. It has nothing to do with anything. It's no illness. It's just totally to do with aging. So there's this kind of cruel joke that as you're peaking in your income earning years, your, your vision's starting to blur. Well, what a shame that you know a dollar twenty-five pair of glasses could extend your income earning potential for decades, even. Um, and then associated with that, you know, it turns out it's really good to see if you're driving a truck, um, and um, it also helps mechanics and, and the like to be able to um, to reduce the risks of accidents, especially as we look at things like road safety. And then importantly for students, um, I think one of the exciting moments for us is the world is really focused not just on getting kids in school, but on the learning outcomes that they're achieving in school. And there was a randomized control trial in China in 2014 that showed that a pair of glasses on a kid's face can increase their learning outcomes um, by six months to one year. So just control for the parent's income, control for the parent's education, stick a pair of glasses on the child's face, and it's like a booster effect of almost a year of incremental earning. And so it's pretty radical. Um, and then the other is you know, affordable quality glasses. We want them to be regularly available with semi-skilled providers. And so what's our role in, in, in helping more and more people figure out how to do basic screening? OK, so all the outputs that we measure, first time wearers, number of vision camps, et cetera, those are just our outputs. And then the social enterprise business model. So I'm going to take us into the models and, and the model evolution. But what we really think about is C to earn, C to learn, C to be safe. OK, so who is our target customer? Target customer earns less than $4 a day. Uh, we know that if we come below a buck twenty-five, we really there's not enough purchasing power down there for us. And it has to be super, super subsidized. And we want 50% of all our customers to be first-time wearers. So at the heart of any business model is a value proposition. So what's our value proposition? We start on the right-hand side with our customer segment. $4 a day, earners and learners, frontier markets. But even though we've got this giant market, 700 million people, we've got to have roots to market. And the roots to market are our B2B customers. And our B2B customers are governments, corporations, NGOs, um, and other commercial agents who are accessing that target population. And so on the left-hand side, then, the value proposition is the product. Nothing fancy about glasses. But we do have an, an obligation that our customers understand them to be radically affordable, so costing one to two, two days wages, um, durable, lasting at least one year, because a lot of things break, uh, and th th they got to be attractive. Like, people actually got to want to wear them. Um, so these are mine, by the way. These are my Vision Spring glasses. Uh, for, these are a prescription. They're $4. Um, uh, in terms of service, I, I can go into the details of those, but one of the most favor important things for us is favorable payment terms uh, for our partners and that we're pricing so that commission can accrue to a local health workforce or to a local NGO. Um, and then the intangibles, what's so great about glasses, unlike as much as I love working on maternal mortality, um, Glasses, like you put them on somebody's face and the impact's immediate. And people start getting income generating uh, benefits in, in days and weeks and months. OK, so um, just going back to like lesson number one, which is the glasses have to look good. I'm going to take the story to Jordan, who is our, our founder, and the story of the, the cat eye glasses. So um, and Kim might know this story. Um, but Jordan, he was on a medical mission. So Jordan's an optometrist, really big practice in, on the Upper East Side in New York. And he goes down to Latin America on, a, on his first mission. And he's seeing hundreds of people wrapped around the clinic for days and days on end. And one of the ladies who comes, and she's, you guys know the story, right? It's like she takes three hours to get there. And she has to take, cross a river and take a ferry. And she's walking. And she has multiple modes of transportation. And she's got terrible, terrible vision. She, I mean, she can barely see right now in this case she had a negative nine uh, diopter. So she you know, can hardly see in front of her nose. And Jordan's got this huge bag of donated glasses, right? sort of jumb all jumbled up. And he fishes around, and he finds the pair for her. And it's like, thank goodness I have something to offer her. And it's cat eyes. And, and so she puts them on, and she can see. And he's thinking, this is amazing. By the way, this is a super inefficient way to do this, but there has to be a better way. But how, how good does it feel that she's going to see? She goes back to her village, makes the really big trip. He's on, you know, patient number, whatever it is, like 800 the next day. And she comes back. And 
he's like, oh, no. And he's telling her, don't worry. You know, wearing glasses can feel a little awkward. It'll just take a couple of days. You'll get used to them. And she goes, oh, no. <laughs> I am not going to get used to people laughing at me. She doesn't want to wear cat eye glasses. And she doesn't want sequins. And she doesn't. And so, like, this is one of those aha moments. Like, oh, we have to have a product that people actually want to put on their faces and they actually want to wear. And donated glasses hauled off of somebody's shelf or, you know, is, is not the answer. So this was sort of one of the first catalytic moments for, for the created uh, Vision Spring. Um, so the current business model is we have um, wholesale distribution, B2B. Uh, and we currently work with about 150 partners um, in 43 countries now, but most of them, uh, over 100 of them, are in India, where we've been doing this the longest. Wholesale, the wholesale business globally is really only a year and a half old at this point. Project implementation. Um, so this is vision access projects, where we basically have two, the revenue model is such that we have either third-party payer, so imagine... Amalgamated Tea contracts us to screen 10,000 of their tea pickers. We find out 80% of them need glasses, uh, and we are able to dispense. So that's a third-party payer model. Or a donor will uh, give us a grant. We'll work with a partner. I'll talk about BRAC in a second. And we're working with that partner to develop a vision access uh, program where they are able to layer in vision screening into their existing services. Um, and then we have retail, which is probably of uh, uh, more interest here. But we have 13 optical shops. Half of them are in hospitals, and we have some standalone. And the question that I'm talking, that I'm looking at currently, and we talked a little bit last night at dinner, was: Do we replicate these or not? Do we franchise these or not? Like, what are we going to do with these? Right? <laughs> I can see somebody going, "No." Right? Right now, we're like, "I don't know." Right? So, um, and and what does that mean in terms of scalability? Okay, so um, just the inspiration for Vision Spring um, was was this this idea of what's um, of Jordan being in Latin America on the mission, serving one patient at a time with with donated glasses, and that that really not being an efficient approach, and so that spurred. Um, the, the, the model and the evolution of how do we get more and more people out there, not optometrists, being able to dispense eyeglasses. So the model has evolved a lot, and it started off with vision entrepreneurs. This is totally classic business in a bag, uh, women in villages, train them to do a really basic eye screening for reading glasses, um, and to be able to dispense reading glasses. Anyone want to guess what we learned and why we don't do it anymore? The unit economics totally don't make sense. Um, so the, you know, it turns out that she didn't have a big enough catchment area. And glasses are a slow-moving commodity. And you're only going to buy one pair of glasses once every two years or so. And so she can't make a living just selling glasses. So we learned some things, though. We did learn that rural, that, that rural poor will pay for glasses. We learned that they'll pay one to two days wages. Uh, and we learned um, that, you know, as a slow-moving, uh, low-margin product, this is not the scalable unit. So we said, let's, give a, let's expand the circumference. And let's expand the catchment area. And so we looked at uh, vans. And then we also thought, well, let's do prescription out of the vans because prescription glasses have a higher margin. Um, so it's hard to find optometrists who want to ride a van around in a van every single day. It's hot. It's hard work. And frankly, they didn't go to school to do, in their minds to do this. And they would like to be in an air-conditioned shop. Um, and um, we also, and we also were looking at um, um, what. But we, did, at this moment in the history, we did want to look at evidence. So this is where we actually did a, a study with the University of Michigan, and we did figure out this, the idea about the direct gains of glasses and, and income earnings. So that was an important moment, and we said, okay, let's take the vans, and we're going to hub and spoke. We're going to do retail. Op we're going to do optical hubs, stores, and we'll do the vans with the outreach. And we said one van to one store. OK, that's not economical. So then we said, we're going to cluster the stores, and we're going to have one van for multiple stores, and they're going to do demand generation around. So um, we haven't totally abandoned hub. We still have hubs. But what did we, what did we learn? Um, we did it in El Salvador. And in El Salvador, we had optical we had the stores. And we were chasing the magic 100% cost recovery. 
Who's chasing 100% cost recovery or making a profit? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so chasing 100% cost recovery forced us to go up market. And we started, our average ticket price was $35. Like, whoa, right? If our, if our customer is supposed to be a $4 a day customer, and then we justified it and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cross-subsidize, and we're going to have higher ticket sales up here, and we're going to cross-subsidize. Well, and then all of a sudden, we're running two businesses and two programs. Then we're running, like, high-level retail, and then we're running um, sort of more of a highly subsidized outreach work. And, and there was a bit of a, a moment, and it was a board-level conversation, and we said, wait a minute, we have come off mission. And actually, in chasing the magic 100% cost recovery, there's a huge opportunity cost because we're actually, for the dollar, donated dollars that are being given to us, we're not actually able to get all these first-time wearers into glasses and all these people who are earning less than $4 a day into glasses. This is a 625 million person problem. Is this model even getting us close to cracking that? And the answer, we said, no, it's not. And so we called up our donors and we invited them into the conversation and we said, we've got to give you our money back, your money back. And um, they were like, what? No one does that. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so, and I said, well, thanks for being transparent. Um, um, well, what else would you like to do? Keep the money and we'll put it on something else. So um, the other really interesting element for us was as we creep up the price tag, then we start bumping into local private sector. And that didn't feel right because we are a donor subsidized model, and that felt like we are directly competing with subsidized, um, you know, with a subsidized approach. And so, so that also didn't feel good. Um, so we still, so we pulled out, we exited uh, out of El Salvador. Um, we sold off um, our stores to a local NGO that um, took them on for other purposes, um, and um, and we still maintain our hubs in India, but we have frozen them. Uh, not in terms of the evolution of what's going on in each store, but we have said we have not earned the right to replicate yet. Um, and so we, um, we have a, a sort of an institutional pause on what we're going to do. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more. Okay, so just uh, looking at the in, uh, sort of couple key lessons coming out of this, and then I'll stop. Um, one of the main things that happened in the board was sort of the identification of a new guiding star in terms of a metric. And this was an, a focus on efficiency. And so we said we're not going to chase 100% cost recovery and we're not chasing profit. We do want to chase a decreasing philanthropic investment per pair, which basically means that every single pair of glasses that we put out into the market, we have to put out with less donor contribution. So what you're seeing here is the brown line is um, the dollar per pair. Can you see here this is Oh, I don't. This is El Salvador, by the way, taking it in the wrong direction is the, is the bump coming up. Um, and then the idea is with the more pairs that we sell as we're coming up, you know, 2010 was 200,000 pairs, uh, and, and hopefully this year we're going to go, cross your fingers for me, we just did our uh, pipeline planning uh, for coming into Q4, uh, we should get to over a million pairs. And our target is $3.61 of donor subsidy per pair. And the idea is over time we want to bring that down to around two seventy, dollars and then we'll see where we go. But our focus is, to, is the idea of the optimal subsidy. How do we reach the most number of people with a sustainable level of donated revenue? Um, okay, in the interest of the time, I'm not going to go too much into, into partnerships, but partnerships... Um, is where we have been working with BRAC. Um, and partnerships is not a business model. So uh, partnerships is just a route to market and, uh, and is an approach. But, one of, but we had a really important lesson here with BRAC. So BRAC has 100,000 community health workers. Um, and we said, well, what if uh, one of the lessons we learned was don't put glasses into the hands of a female entrepreneur by itself, but what if we put glasses into a bundle of goods, right? So what's great about BRAC is they are already selling or rehydration solution and, and birth control pills and the like, and we added glasses, right? And, and so what we said was, why don't we train community health workers to be able to do a basic vision screening, include glasses in the bundle of goods that they're already selling? 
We have evolved the model a lot, but the path to scale started 10 years ago. Uh, so sometimes these things take a while. Um, and it started with 50 community health workers, just as a totally small test. And then we played around and we tinkered with it. And I just want to talk about what happened here was we said, you know what? Glasses, because they um, are an incremental, uh, uh, an irregular purchase, it's actually not in the community health worker's talk track to talk about vision. She's talking about maternal health and she's talking about childhood vaccination. She's actually a pretty terrible sales agent for glasses. So she's great, but she's, ter and, and, but she's, she's not a great sales agent. So what we did was we created a camp structure we created vision screeners, so these are specialists. They are on salary. She does all the mobilization in her community that says, you're over 35, you're over 40, come on this day. If, if you have, if you suspect you have a cataract or something bad, we can check it for you. We're not going to be able to treat it. There's nothing like having a really upset customer who comes to get their cataract uh, dealt with when you can only help them with glasses. Um, and, when, and when we sell the glasses, the commission accrues to her for the social mobilization. She gets 30 cents a pair. And so what's really exciting is by turning some knobs with regard to price point, team structure, and marketing, um, we were actually able to increase sales last year from 12,000 pairs in August to this year, 26,000 pairs a month. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and at that volume, we're going to do 225,000 pairs of glasses this year. And at that volume, now the program has the potential to be self-sustaining. Um, and what's really exciting for BRAC is BRAC is about to have middle-income country status. BRAC is about to uh, and needs to sustain its community health workforce with less and less donor dollars. And by having some revenue-generating opportunities, it, it, um, it helps to stabilize their, their workforce. Um, okay, so the current business model, I just want to, in terms of percentages, wholesale 65% of our volume. Uh, our vision access projects is 30%, which is where the BRAC program falls in, and to the question about, like, should we scale retail? Right now it's only 5% of our total volume. Um, so I'll just leave, leave us with, with two last thoughts. One is, um, you know, we've been at this for 15 years, we've reached 3 million people. Um, we're in, in 43 countries, but we really always try to take a beginner's mindset. Um, and the idea is um, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, and in the expert's mind, there are very few. And so we just are always learning something new. And it's totally not rocket science, it's just glasses. But um, you know, whether it's South Sudan or Rwanda or Bangladesh, there's so much to learn. Um, and then the final um, is, what does it mean to be a social enterprise? And we talk about um, the opposable thumbs. And so in our organization, we talk a lot about the opposable mind. And the opposable mind is that we have to hold in constructive tension revenue and sales targets and social impact targets. And so for us, we often sit uh, in, in this place of tension about, and what are the trade-offs and what are the... And, and how many people are going to benefit, um, or what, what kind of revenue will we be able to generate? What kind of rate are we hemorrhaging cash? Um, and, and so in all of our meetings, we hold up sets of metrics, which are our revenue and our business uh, metrics, which has at the center the decreasing subsidy per pair. Um, and on our social side, how many corrective pairs of glasses, how many first-time wearers. Um, so, that's that's where we've been that's where we've come and and so we're and we're still going and learning